welcome to my dorm. Today I'm here to talk about my submission to the 2020 GrabCAD Extreme Redesign Contest. In the community, we've almost reached the limits for 3D printing thermoplastics using filament. The machines have come down in cost greatly. However, there are almost no solutions out there for fabricating parts from metal on the desktop. Here, I'm going to show you how to modify your 3D printer's infrastructure to cut and mill nearly any metal. For this process, I designed a custom motion platform that can be used for applications such as this using modular tool heads. With today's desktop machines, it's very easy to 3D print parts like this out of thermoplastic. This could be made out of PLA, PETG, ABS, nylon, and they can be made quite well with good accuracy and precision. However, if you want to be able to make metal parts to stand up to extreme temperature or have a great rigidity and toughness, you're out of luck. What I have here are some parts that are absolutely essential for making 3D printers. What all of these things have in common is they're absolutely essential for making CNC machines and 3D printers, but we have no, absolutely no way to make them ourselves at home. Imagine if you were able to make all of these parts at home out of metal. It would be quite amazing. You'd be able to take any part you like, redesign it, modify it to whatever application you had. You'd be able to come up with new solutions to problems you were facing, whether for your business or at home for some project. In addition, you wouldn't be relying on the market and other people to supply your parts for you. You could always be able to make anything you needed right on your desktop. You could replicate your 3D printer for, say, every part on it. Some people, in an effort to be able to cut metals on their 3D printers, have heavily modified them to increase rigidity and resilience against vibration and to exert great amounts of force. They'll attach these spindles or dremels to their 3D printers and in hopes that they'll be able to cut maybe aluminum. However, most 3D printers are not up to the task and it's extremely expensive to do. What we need is a way to get rid of metal without all the noise, all the complexity, the forces involved. Uh, we need to really simplify this to redesign this whole system. So what about electrolysis? Well, we could use electrochemistry. So let's say we have something like a sewing needle, a conductive piece of metal, very thin. Let's call this our cathode. Let's call this our cathode. So we attach this to ground. And then we have our workpiece. So this is the tool piece, this is the workpiece. This is the metal that we want to machine and manipulate and get rid of selectively. So these are two conductive pieces of metal and this will be our anode. So we attach this to positive 12 volts, say, for 3D printers, because this is what is commonly used for the voltage. Now, because we're doing electrolysis, at the cathode, electrons will flow in, and we can apply water here, salt water here. Salt water is conductive, so we'll get a current through the salt water. And when you apply a current through salt water at the cathode, you will have water, H2O, convert to hydroxide ions and hydrogen gas. This isn't a balanced equation, of course. So we get hydroxyl ions and hydrogen gas. So the hydrogen gas will leave, float out, and in the salt water, in this area, we are going to have these reactive hydroxyl ions. Now at the anode, we have the opposite process uh, occurring. The anode, uh, we are going to be taking our metal. So let's use steel as an example. We have iron, and we are going to be adding electrons and as a result, we are going to get an ion forming. Now these uh, ferric uh, ions, I3, iron 3 plus, are extremely reactive along with the hydroxyls. So these are going to react and we're going to get uh, a mixture of hydroxides and oxides as our products. And these are uh, insoluble, so they'll be washed away. So what we're effectively doing is we're using electric current and electrolysis to get rid of metal underneath this electrode and then wash it away when it precipitates as an iron oxide or hydroxide. Uh, this whole process of machining away metal or any conductive material using electrical currents uh, is ar has already been done. It's been known since the 30s. There are two methods of doing it. One is electrochemical machining, ECM, which is the process I just explained where you have two electrodes uh, and salt water between them and you dissolve away the metal selectively. Another is very similar. It's called electrical discharge machining. Instead of using electrolysis and dissolving away the metal that you want to get rid of, 
uh, it vaporizes it aggressively. Uh, it uses extremely high current or voltage uh, to do this. Uh, this is a very interesting process and I recommend looking into it. But the problem with electrical discharge machining is that it requires high-end power supplies, expensive power supplies, uh, things that can shock you and electrocute you. Whereas with electrochemical machining, we can do this at very low uh, voltages with relatively low amperages, 12 volts at 300 uh, milliamps in the example I'm going to show today. Whereas with electrical discharge machining, you might have to use tens of thousands of volts at many amps. So there is already a, a law ex that we know about, uh, have known about for a long time, Faraday came up with it, to uh, predict how much material we're going to remove based on how many amps we put in so we can control how much material is removed based on how much energy we put in. So mass is equal to the current that we have multiplied by the time we apply it multiplied by the molar mass of our material divided by Faraday's constant multiplied by the valency. So in the case of aluminum, you get aluminum's atomic mass or molar mass you would have a valency of three, because aluminum has three valence electrons. Faraday's constant, how many amps you're using, so 10, 5, 300 milliamps, it doesn't matter. And then time, so if we're doing for one second, uh, this we could just calculate in one second how many how many grams of aluminum we're, we're removing. Now, as it turns out, if we are operating with 10 amps over one second, uh, we can actually remove at 100% efficiency uh, 5.59 times 10 to the negative 4 grams, which if you do the math, equates to 3.67 millimeters uh, radius if it were a sphere. So we can cut uh, a lot of material, relatively a lot of material out uh, under do very doable conditions. This is the sort of thing that you could apply maybe with a simple power supply. This is the electrochemical machining tool head. In the back, there's a catch for the X carriage to lock it in place. By just sliding this in, and pulling back this latch, it'll keep it in place. At the front, you'll see that this bolt is connected to a wire. This wire is connected to a 5 volt regulator, which goes to the Z min pin for auto bed leveling. Another wire is here that connects to another bolt at the bottom. This is connected to a relay, which may connect it to ground. Depending on what position, this carriage is in, it'll make electrical contact with either the bottom bolt or the top bolt. This is crucial. This whole carriage rides on two three millimeter metal rails and is held in place using generic springs. This blue tube right here carries electrolyte salt water from a parastatic pump and is angled so that it sprays it at the tip of the needle. The reason why we want to be able to connect this to two different so two different electrical circuits. The reason why we want to be able to connect this to diff two different electrical circuits is because we want to do two different tasks with this hot end. The first is auto bed leveling. Our tool piece is connected to positive 12 volts, which means that when we drive this in we'll, and press it down, we'll be making electrical contact with this bolt up here, which is connected to the five volt regulator in the Z min pin. That's what allows us to do auto bed leveling. We can probe multiple points on the 12 volt plate and that's how we can figure out the distance to that. In addition, that travel distance for the X carriage is our Z offset. This is basically a fixed mounted auto bed leveling probe or more correctly, tramming. The bottom bolt right here, which is connected to ground, allows us to do electrochemical machining. When it's in the normal position forward, where the needle is in electrical contact with this pin right here. This is connected to ground through the relay. relay. So when the relay is turned on, we're able to do electrical chemical machining. This right here is the five volt regulator, which allows us to connect the 12 volt output from the ECM head for auto bed leveling to the Arduino, which takes five volts. This is just a little relay module that I got off Amazon. They're very cheap. You can attach this to the fan pin on your Arduino and use a G-code command to turn off and on the fan for electrical chemical machining, which will connect this bottom wire to ground and allow us to etch away material.
This is a parastatic pump. You can get it on Amazon for approximately $20. What's really interesting about this is that none of the parts responsible for the actual pumping uh, are in contact with the liquid, meaning that you can use these to pump sterile liquids, corrosive liquids, acids, strong bases, and you won't have to worry about damaging this pump. This is really good for our application because we'll be pumping electrolyte, which is conductive, and a corrosive. So we here we have this directly the tool head, holes, which and is seated in place. And on the bottom, on we have our pool and tank, for which uh, that collects the salt water after it washes down onto the uh, to, onto the workpiece, and it flows down and goes through this tube at the bottom into our uh, bin, a gallon jug that's full of salt water. And we have a pump, a peristatic pump, that pumps water through this tube uh, with our wires in it, through the blue Bowden tube, down onto our, our needle. And that, that's how we get a continuous flow of salt water electrolyte. So let's auto home this machine. So a G28 from the menu. Start our example. So we're going to cut a square. Now this is doing uh, three points for bed leveling. One point here, one point here, and then one point back. So we have three points to define the plane of our workpiece. After we do our final piece, I'm going to flip a switch and turn on the salt water for the pump, and then we're going to start electrochemically machining this piece of steel using nothing but a few milliamps of current and some time. I've set this to do 100 passes over this tool piece at a distance of 100 microns away. You can see those bubbles forming around the needle as like a little white area. So we're going to leave this on for a while and see what happens. After approximately one hour, we've cut this significant groove into this metal. It's approximately 300 microns, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but mind you, we were moving uh, only 300 milliamps of current through the wire uh, when it was measured. So not bad considering that we have power supplies that are able to push 30 amps uh, commonly in the 3D printing community. So if we were to use one of these power supplies, we could cut much more material. In fact, you could probably very easily cut all the way through this steel uh, and be able to make parts. You'll also notice how wide this roof is and that's once again the fact because we're using low currents over many many passes in addition the needle the electrode that we're using is not ice is not isolated or insulated uh, we could insulate everything on the needle but the tip and get much cleaner cuts however over here this is 200 passes uh, took about an hour uh, at a higher speed and after each pass the z-axis would move down slightly into the, the workpiece. And as a result, these grooves are much deeper. This is approximately a millimeter deep, uh, working at the same current. And you'll notice that the grooves are also much sharper because it's not hovering over the same place as long. In fact, if, if you were to keep this running, you could, you could almost certainly cut through the entire tool, this entire workpiece. This is another cut. However, it's, a, it's circular. This is done at a much faster speed with more passes, with these little holes on the side to allow liquid to drain down during the process. What I have here is what's called a microfluidic chip. And if you, if I hold this up and catch the light with this, right, you might be able to see there are these little structures between the glass and this p piece of PDMS, which is a sort of a thermoplastic. So there are these tiny grooves cut in here. Uh, and when you put liquids inside, you can do all sorts of manipulation. Uh, eventually what you'd be able to do is build what's called a lab on a chip where you put in chemicals in the top, uh, you get all sorts of reactions, you can observe those reactions uh, on this device. And this is a, an essential piece of equipment when doing drug discovery to find new medicines. It's a piece of essential equipment for diagnosing diseases. Uh, however, to build a microfluidic device uh, like this requires many hours of work in a sterile room in a clean room using many thousands of dollars of equipment. This could, uh, chip could be the result of a day's labor for a researcher. Uh, I built this uh, two years ago during an internship. 
uh, it involved many stages of cleaning, of using vacuum chambers, uh, used uh, photolithography. This is not something that a biohacker or someone who's interested in doing biochemistry at home could do. However, with a machine uh, like we've built today, one of the things that we could do is use a very thin capillary tube with an electrode in it and move that around and do cuts that way and make microfluidic devices like this out of aluminum instead of PDMS and glass like this is. This is the 3D printing tool head uh, on the current version of the X carriage. So we can just move this up and we can pull out this and we can show this off. So we have an E3D original hot end in here and we have the cooling fan and a BL touch. This all connects through, this is actually two pieces that are bolted together. There are threaded inserts that go in here and this all bolts together with M3 bolts. Uh, we have an E3D heating uh, cartridge and thermistor uh, and a BL touch sensor. When you make, uh, after you print out all the parts and put it together, you just put it inside like so, clamp it down, and then you'd be ready for printing. So let's go take a look at that. This is the LabVox motion platform that I've designed. It's a core XY machine with a dual Z axis. It's built out of these 2020 aluminum extrusions, which are very cheap. You can order them on Amazon for about $4 a meter. In addition, it's extremely rigid. It has swappable tool heads on the X carriage, which allows you to exchange an ECM head, for example, with a 3D printer head, or a bioprinting head, or a pick and place, or camera head. The reason I chose a Core XY system is that you don't have the tool head moving around in the Z axis. So if it's heavy or if it's light, it doesn't make a difference. In addition, by having the Z axis stay still, you'll get greater precision and accuracy along that axis. Okay. It's designed to use sensorless homing for the X and Y axes and two end stops at the bottom for the Z axis, here and here, which are secured via M3 bolts and threaded inserts. It uses any 12 volt power supply. It's designed to accept an E3D hot end and you can use whatever extruder you like with it by mounting it to these 2020 rails. It uses LMU 8 bushings with linear rods. This is a standard NEMA 17 stepper motor. They're essential on every 3D printer that's common. They have four inputs and they have very good precision. They're also cheap and simple. Imagine if you were able to make stepper motors like this at home on a desktop machine you'd be able to duplicate your 3D printer almost completely. You'd be able to make lots of different robots, CNC machines from these motors that you can make at home. Well, how can we do this? Well, we need to be able to cut out the metal frame and the rotor inside and the shaft. Now, these are not complicated parts. The hardest part would probably be winding the coils by hand. So how can we find a way to make these metal parts at home?